Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved in helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we are continuing our conversation with Nathan Winograd, as this is part two of our show. So I hope you'll enjoy listening in and hearing our conversation with Nathan. I'd like to welcome Nathan Winograd back to the show. At the end of part one, we were just sort of wrapping up and Nathan was describing his dream world for cats 10 years down the road for our community cats and is absolutely fantastic. And if you didn't catch part one, I recommend you go listen to part one first. But you also, Nathan, you were talking a lot about legal issues, legal representation, and you were chatting quite a bit about the individual rights of cats. We didn't really get into the larger picture, and you've been a proponent written about an act called CAPA. Is that correct? Yes, it's called the Companion Animal Protection Act, and it is designed to create basic rights for cats and dogs and other animals that enter shelters so that all shelters become a temporary way station to a better life rather than what a fair number of them are, and that is the end of the line for many cats. It goes into quite a bit of detail. The version that I was looking at referenced it more from a city council perspective. Is it supposed to be used on a more local level or is it supposed to be broad ranging or multi-purposed? Well, it depends on how high you want to set your sight. So for example, <laughs> we talked in part one of our interview about a law we passed when I was still at the San Francisco SPCA. And it was a statewide law that did a number of things. But one one of the things that it did is made it illegal for shelters to kill animals when qualified rescue groups were willing to save them. And it also included community cats. So in California right now, it is illegal for a shelter to kill a cat if a rescue group is willing to save that cat. And as I said, that includes community cat. So what I did was I took the kinds of programs and services that allowed us to reduce killing to all-time lows in San Francisco that we partially wrote into state law back in 1998 a lot of people know it as the Hayden Law because it was sponsored by then Senator Tom Hayden, but its official name is the 1998 California Animal Shelter Law into a model legislation I call the Companion Animal Protection Act. That law was passed in part by the state of Delaware as state law. Since that time, the percentage of dogs and cats killed in the state of Delaware has really plummeted. Last year, Delaware saved roughly 90 percent of all dogs and cats that entered its statewide shelter system. But it doesn't have to be a state law. It can also be passed as a local ordinance. And parts of CAPA have been passed in various cities around the country, like Austin, Texas, for example. And Austin is a great example, Stacy, because this is a shelter system that serves about 1 million people. It takes in roughly 20,000 dogs and cats a year. Last year, it saved somewhere in the neighborhood of 98% of dogs and 96% of cats. What I'm most excited about is that CAPA has been passed in full at the city level. So Austin was city and county, and the city of Muncie, Indiana, just passed a CAPA and added uh, several things that aren't in the other ordinances. And that is, uh, not only are they required by law to maintain at least a 90% percent live release rate for cats, but it makes it illegal for the municipal shelter to kill healthy and treatable cats. And in fact, says that if the cat is healthy and they don't have kennel space and they don't have kennel space that they can share with another cat and they can't set up temporary kennel space in the shelter and they've tried rescue groups and they've tried foster homes, that as a last resort, the cat has to be sterilized and released back 
to his or her habitat before being killed. So we're starting to see incredible progress on the legislative side so that cats live regardless of who is running the shelter and how passionate they are about saving lives. And so that shelter directors can come and go and the life saving continues in perpetuity. I know that there are a lot of situations when legislation has passed and the intent might have been one way, but how it actually gets implemented happens another way. Have you seen anything of that happening in these various communities? I haven't. And the longer we go, the more laws we pass. Obviously, there's always a learning curve. So, for example, when we passed the law in 1998 in California, one of the things we did was we defined dogs and cats as either adoptable or treatable. And the definition of treatable was talking about cats, a cat who can be made adoptable with reasonable effort. What we didn't foresee, Stacy, is all sorts of mental gymnastics and narrow readings that regressive shelters would employ to try to define cats as not adoptable or treatable. So one shelter called diarrhea or URI, you know, the equivalent of the common cold or red eyes, you know, conjunctivitis as not treatable because some of that takes longer than the holding period to resolve. So they said if any condition can't be resolved within the holding period, then the condition is untreatable and those animals were killed. And it's crazy to call a cat with mild flu-like symptoms untreatable or a cat with a broken leg that takes longer than the holding period to heal is untreatable. So we were naive. We had naively thought that they would implement the new law with integrity in order to save the largest number of cats, but they didn't do that. As we developed CAPA and as we sought to pass it in other communities, we have closed those loopholes. And it's tragic because what we have done essentially with the Companion Animal Protection Act in the places that we've passed it is we have started to remove the discretion that allows shelter directors to avoid doing what's in the best interest of cats and kill them needlessly. And part of that was coming to the realization that just because you work at an animal shelter or a humane society or an SPCA doesn't mean you are passionate about cats and saving their lives. For many people, working at these places is a job. It's not a mission. And so in order to prevent them from choosing the convenience killing over life-saving options, which in some cases require hard work. We have regulated these facilities and forced them to act in ways that have proven over and over in hundreds of communities across the country to save lives. So, I mean, it would be great if everyone implemented these programs voluntarily and willingly, but they don't. And so where they don't, we found that passing laws reduces death rates significantly, is saving tens of thousands of animals, and is is resulting in live release rates as high as 98, 99%. I mean, in California, Stacy, that rescue rights provision, just that provision alone saves about 50,000 animals a year that would have been killed in years past. I think it is great that we're thinking about this. I'm even concerned about in communities in New England where we don't have much on the books for cats, where we've done such great work how do we ensure that protection years ahead? And that's where my mental thoughts are, long-term protection beyond our time. Absolutely. And that is key because it's great when you have progressive leadership. You know, if you look at the city of Muncie, Indiana, for example, their shelter director took a shelter that was killing roughly half the animals and last year finished with something on the order of a 97, 98% live release rate for cats and has been doing a good job for a number of years. You would think that given what a good job the shelter is doing, that Muncie is the last place you should worry about passing such a law because 
there are communities across the country that are killing 97, 98% of cats. However, when their director, Phil Peckinpah, approached me, he said, look, I'm not going to live forever. I'm not going to live in Muncie, Indiana, perhaps forever. You know, I'm going to retire. I'm going to move. I'm going to find another job. How do I ensure that the success we have in Muncie continues long after I'm gone, in fact, forever? And one way we do that is through legislation, by codifying, enacting into law the kinds of practices that Phil has been doing voluntarily in Muncie to save the lives of cats. So as I said, when he goes, if the new director is passionate, loves cats, and is passionate about saving lives, fantastic. But what happens if that person is not? Well, under legislation and the law in Muncie, they're not going to be able to kill cats if rescue groups are willing to save them. They are not going to be able to kill cats unless they notify the family who surrender that cat. Of course, if there's evidence of neglect or cruelty, this doesn't apply, but call the family that surrendered the cat and give them the opportunity to take the cat back. They're not going to be able to kill the cat in the case of strays unless they notify the finder and give them the opportunity to take back the cat. It'll be illegal to kill cats if there are empty cages or kennels or other living environments in the shelter, including space to set up temporary living environments. It's illegal in Muncie to kill cats if the cat can share a cage or kennel with another cat. They have to plea the cat out to foster homes. And as I said, if all those things fail and the cat is healthy, they have to sterilize and release the cat. So that ensures protections for cats in Muncie. And those are the kinds of things that we need to do all over the country. That has to become the law of the land. Because while I have no doubt, as I said in the first part of our interview, that we will eventually become no kill for cats in every city, in every town, in every shelter across the country. If we want to ensure that that continues indefinitely, we do that the same way every social movement in U.S. history has done that through the force of law. If you like the Community Cats podcast and would like to help promote Community Cats in your state, then we need you. We're looking for a couple of people from each state to be Community Cats ambassadors. What do you get by being an ambassador? You'll be mailed a promo kit of items to use to help promote the show at any event that you attend in your state. If you don't attend many events, hey, that's okay too. Do you have a network of people that love community cats? You can help with email and groups in your state to let them know about the CCP and offer them the benefit of community cat swag. The more we can spread the word about the show, the more we can do to help cats across the country. Please email Stacy, S-T-A-C-Y, at communitycatspodcast.com if you'd like to represent your state. Thank you. I want to hear from you what the Community Cats Podcast means to you. You can now leave a recorded testimonial on the Community Cats Podcast website and share your thoughts about the show. You can also ask questions, share show ideas, pretty much anything you want. Just go to www.communitycatspodcast.com and click on the testimonial link and record. You hear from me all of the time, and now I want to hear from you. Thank you. So I'm going to quickly turn the tables just a little bit for the last few minutes that we have of this interview, and I can't believe we're almost near the end, but we are. There have been quite a few large organizations over the years that you have really publicly questioned their uh, approaches and their support of community cats. And I'm just wondering, from our perspective, is this something that we should be doing too as individuals? Why do you do it? What is the reasoning behind that approach? These organizations are very large and they are very influential and they have, in some cases, unlimited resources. While the rest of us are in the trenches fighting for every dollar and putting the medical expenses for cats we find on our credit cards, there are organizations, Stacy, that take in over $100 million per year, $50 million, $60 million, even $150 million a year. And when public officials, when government 
government officials, when mayors, when governors, legislators of all kinds, the media, even people who find cats and they don't know about TNR, they don't know about community cat sterilization, they'll turn to these organizations and they'll be given advice that causes cats to lose their lives. We fight for no kill for cats and for the rights of cats to their very lives on multiple levels. Sometimes we fight with our neighbors. Sometimes we fight with the local shelters. Sometimes we fight against regressive state laws, health department practices, but sometimes we have to fight against the large national organizations because in many cases they stand between the cats living and dying and between where we are now and a no-kill nation. And I'll give you a great example because I know you've interviewed them on your show, but back in the dark old days, sometime in the 1990s, I worked with an organization in the Outer Banks of North Carolina that the local SPCA was trying to round up and kill the community cats that they were caring for. And like when I was at Stanford and even before I got to Stanford with the folks who eventually became the Stanford Cat Network and started a TNR program on the campus, the community cat advocates in the Outer Banks of North Carolina turned to the Humane Society of the United States for help with their local SPCA who was going after their cats. Back then, HSUS sided with the local Humane Society and said that community cats should be rounded up and killed. And they, in fact, turned to a local criminal prosecutor saying that trapping cats for spay and neuter, for sterilization, and then releasing the cats amounted to abandonment in violation of the state anti-cruelty laws. And those cat lovers, those uh, TNR advocates should be prosecuted and put in jail. I was working at the time for an organization that did legal defense work for animals and for the people who cared for them. And we convinced the prosecutor that in fact, it was no such thing, that they were caring for the cats that somebody else abandoned. And thankfully the prosecutor sided with us. But it was the kind of pressure that we put on HSUS that caused them back, I believe it was 2006, to change their policy from embracing catch and kill to embracing TNR. And now when people call HSUS, as you know, they have a very pro-TNR position. The same is true of all the other large national organizations with one exception, and that is People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Of all the national organizations, really, they're the only ones that continue to defend the roundup and killing of cats. Not only do they round up and kill community cats themselves, putting to death neonatal kittens, four-week-old healthy kittens, six-week-old healthy kittens, six-month-old healthy kittens, one-year-old juveniles, adult community cats, but they routinely reach out to other communities, encouraging them to round up and kill cats. Recently, they argued to the mayor of Seaside Heights, New Jersey, that rather than allow the community cats to continue to live on the boardwalk where they were all sterilized and cared for by volunteers, they should be rounded up and killed. They argued to Camden County, New Jersey, for example, that they should continue the practice of rounding up and killing the cats in the shelter when Camden County officials were debating whether to embrace TNR. So as long as those organizations are out there either killing cats themselves or advocating that cats killed and opposing TNR, we're duty bound to oppose them expose them, and ultimately, like our success with HSUS, force them to embrace more ethical and humane policies. And I think that what you're saying is true, is we all should check out every organization that we are contributing to, volunteering with, and really understand what their mission, what their programs, what they're actually doing, really just understand what they are doing before really committing anything to them. I think that's right. And uh, I think if there is a central lesson here at the risk of being repetitive of our earlier discussions, that is don't assume that just because an organization has the word humane or ethical or prevention of cruelty to animals, that all their policies are geared toward recognizing and protecting the inherent birthright of every cat to their very lives. Learn about their policies when they are less than progressive 
aggressive and in some organizations when they are truly regressive, then don't donate, encourage others not to donate, and also work to change those policies so that we can achieve the day and time in the United States Hopefully not in the too distant future where the right of every cat to his or her life is protected and where every individual cat is revered and loved. Nathan, if folks are interested in finding out more about the books you've written, which I can't believe we haven't even had time to talk about, or reaching out to you or finding out more about the work that you do, how could they do that? Well, I have an organization. I'm, as you said in the bio, the executive director of the No Kill Advocacy Center, and they can go to nokilladvocacycenter.org. And Stacy, they can find there about 25 free step-by-step guides to reforming the practices of their local shelters and creating no-kill communities. And if they're more interested in the philosophy of no-kill and the philosophy of animal rights and my own personal work with community cats and other animals, they can visit my personal website at nathanwinograd.com. And Nathan, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Too often, Stacy, especially for those of us who have been in the trenches for a very, very long time, or those who live in communities who have not embraced a culture of life-saving, it can seem really overwhelming, and it can seem really impossible. And they look around and they see cats being killed in large numbers, and it can seem like there's very little way to get out of that quagmire. And I would encourage them not to give up hope and not to lose sight of the larger picture. Because what happens when you're in the trenches is that you can get myopic. You see the sheer number of animals coming into a shelter, how few are getting adopted, how many are being killed, and you can become very pessimistic about human nature. But for those of us who have seen communities that were that regressive become beacons of life-saving, now saving 98, 99% of the cats, and as I said, some of them having years where they save 100% of the cats, see very large organizations that used to round up and kill cats, embrace community cat sterilization, and see the huge hundreds of communities across the country, cities and towns all across of every conceivable demographic in the North, in the South, rich, poor, politically conservative, politically liberal, urban, rural, embrace the no-kill model. We have seen with our own eyes what can happen when you remain optimistic, when you put in place the programs and services that save lives. And when you never give up, never give up, never give up, you too can someday and will someday live in a community that values the rights of cats and works to protect and revere them. Nathan, I want to thank you so, so very much for being a guest on my show. And hopefully we'll have you on again in the future. Anytime, Stacy. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for listening to a Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 